I always get a lot more applause when I walk on stage with you. <laughs> yeah. Good afternoon. Welcome again to the John F. Kennedy Jr. Forum. My name is Eric Anderson. I'm the director of the Fellows and Study Groups programs here at the Institute of Politics. We're pleased to have with us White House Press Secretary Josh Ernest here today, and he will be interviewed by IOP fellow Brent Colburn. Brent Colburn has spent the better part of the past two decades working in presidential campaign politics, but he's also served in high levels of the Obama administration, most recently serving as assistant to the Secretary of Defense for Public Affairs. Brent is here as an IOP fellow working with our students and running a study group, looking at the differences and similarities between campaigns and governing. And so I welcome all of you, especially the students in the room, to attend his study group, which is taking place every Thursday at 4 p.m. in the faculty dining room, just over there. So with that, Brent Colburn. Thanks. Um, <laughs> thanks, Josh. Appreciate that. So uh, thanks, Eric, uh, and thank you all for being here today. A couple quick things at the top, uh, and then we'll get into what I know you all came for today, which is to, to hear from Josh. Uh, first, just want to say thank you to Harvard uh, for hosting us today. Uh, you know, this is an incredible institution. It's great, I know, for the both of us to get to, to spend time and do things here. Uh, second, I wanted to thank the IOP for sponsoring the event. I want to thank all the students for coming, and I, and I think it's Freshman Parents Weekend, so I want to thank all the parents that are uh, here in the audience today. Um, I'm going to keep my introduction of Josh very short. Uh, one, because you probably already know who he is. Uh, two, because I want him to talk a little bit about how he got where he is today. But a couple highlights. Uh, as you probably know, Josh is the 30th uh, person to be the press secretary for the President of the United States. Uh, he was part of the original Obama team going back to 2007, uh, where he ran the communications operation uh, for the uh, Iowa caucus, which was a, a victorious uh, event for uh, then Senator Obama and a, and a real turning point in his journey to the presidency. He's also worked on a number of uh, both winning and losing uh, campaigns uh, at the national, statewide, uh, and congressional level. Um, outside of being uh, the spokesperson uh, for the president, he has another full-time job. Uh, he is the husband of Natalie Wyeth Ernest, who's here with us somewhere today. Uh, and I, I think she's hiding, so I can brag <laughs> on her a little bit. She is also, if you get a chance to say hi to her, uh, an incredible public servant in her own right, uh, most recently serving as the head of public affairs for the Treasury Department. Uh, which is an incredible job. Uh, and he is also the uh, uh, father to Walker Wyeth Ernest, uh, who probably has the most fans at Harvard at this point <laughs> of any of the family. So, uh, and then just in the spirit of full disclosure, uh, this is not the first time Josh and I have met. Uh, we are very old friends. Uh, actually, we met on the 2004 Kerry campaign, uh, working at the Democratic National Committee. And uh, as I said yesterday, that uh, campaign is famous for clearing the way for John Kerry to become the Secretary of State by not allowing him to be the President of the United States. So <laughs> I think we both played an instrumental part in that journey. So, so with that, uh, I think we'll just dive right in. Uh, we're going to talk for about 30 minutes and then open it up to questions. So, so Josh, a lot of folks in this audience, especially the students, uh, I'm sure would love to follow you as the 31st Press Secretary uh, at the White House. Uh, so could you lay out for them the incredibly detailed and well thought out plan that took you from 22 years <laughs> old to where you are today? Yeah. Well, uh, first of all, thank you, Brent, for uh, agreeing to moderate this conversation. And thank you to everybody for being here today. And it's a genuine honor to, uh, uh, to be at this uh, hallowed institution and to have an opportunity to speak here. So I'm, uh, I'm looking forward to the conversation. The, uh, in terms of my career, uh, there, if there ever was a plotted path, uh, it was a path, path that I deviated from uh, many, many years ago. It, um, when I first graduated from college, or even before I graduated from college, I wasn't quite sure what I wanted to do. I had studied uh, political science at Rice University uh, in Houston, Texas. And I got a great education there, uh, but in March of my senior year, I wasn't quite sure exactly what I wanted to do. And I went and met with my uh, advisor at the time, uh, who was known as the local television pundit uh, in politics in Houston. Uh, and he was well-connected in local politics, and he suggested that, since I did, wasn't quite sure what I wanted to do with my life, that I should go and work in local politics, that working on a political campaign is a great way to get involved in politics. And so I think the most direct answer to your question that I, that I would have is that if you're interested in getting involved in politics, working on a campaign of somebody that you really believe in is a great way to get involved in politics. Uh, pol uh, campaigns in particular have a, uh, have a characteristic about them which is that they rely a lot on people uh, not being part of an organized, already created institution to elect somebody to office. This is an institution that has to be built from the bottom up. 
Uh, and I, I know that some of your uh, uh, business school colleagues across the river would probably observe that this is a, an enterprise that is both built up rapidly and then run into the ground on election day. <laughs> Uh, and uh, that's an apt way to describe uh, those kinds of organizations. But what it means is it means that if you are dedicated, if you are persistent, if you're conscientious, if you're talented, uh, that talent, talent will quickly show itself. Uh, and what you'll find on campaigns is that if you uh, are the best person uh, answering the phones and you're the most conscientious and you show up on time and you're willing to stay late and you're particularly courteous even to the crazy people who are calling, uh, pretty soon somebody who's in a position of responsibility in that campaign is gonna give you a different job. Uh, or at least ask you to do some other things in addition to answering the phone. Uh, and so it, it, those who are interested in working in politics um, have a great opportunity to, to go and, uh, uh, and work on a campaign to really uh, get involved. So you've got your Rice degree. Mm -hmm. You finished your four years of higher education. Um, you've decided this is what you want to try. Yeah. Uh, you show up. What was your first paycheck? What did that first job yeah. look like? Yeah. Well, so the, uh, the candidate that I worked for was actually a man named Lee Brown, uh, who did, uh, I'll spoil a little bit of the story, he actually did win the race. <laughs> um, but he was on faculty at Rice at the time, and he had actually been uh, in law enforcement. He'd been the police commissioner in the city of Houston in the early 80s. He spent some time as the police commissioner in New York City, uh, and then was actually President Clinton's drug czar for a while. And so I went in during his office hours knowing that he was preparing to run for mayor. I went in during his office hours and I said, uh, Dr. Brown, I'd really like to come work on your mayoral campaign. I hear you're running. And he said, well, I'm probably going to run, but I haven't yet hired a campaign manager yet. So when I hire that person, why don't you go talk to them? So a couple months later, he finally hired a campaign manager uh, over the summer after I graduated. So I went into the campaign manager and said, I'm you know, interested in politics. I don't know a whole lot, but I'm willing to work hard, and I'd like to get a job in the campaign. And he looked me in the eye, and he said, I've got good news, and I've got bad news. I said, well, let me hear it. What's, what's, <laughs> He said, well, let me start with the good news. He said, we would love to have you involved in this campaign. This is going to be a national campaign. It's an off-year election. It's an open seat. It's going to be very competitive. There are national political implications for this race. People are going to be paying attention. And you have an opportunity to get in on the ground level. Uh, and this will be a great way for you to learn the ropes in politics. Uh, I thought, well, that sounds great. What's the bad news? And he said, the bad news is we can't pay you. <laughs> and I said, I will take it, <laughs> primarily because I didn't have other options. Uh, but mostly because it was a genuinely interesting opportunity and a way for me to continue my education in politics. And uh, so I worked uh, essentially nine to five on that campaign. Uh, and then I had uh, a job in the evening teaching uh, Princeton Review to high school students who were hoping to do well in the SAT and get into schools like Rice. <laughs> uh, and so it meant that I would spend a lot of time getting to know the staff. I worked closely with the campaign manager and other members of the core staff. And five o'clock would roll around and I'd say, look, I'm working on this project, but I gotta go, I gotta pay the rent. And they'd say, okay, well, we'll see you tomorrow at nine. So ultimately, after about six or eight weeks of that, the campaign manager called me into his office one day and he said, if you will quit all of your other jobs that everybody around here says that you have, uh, I will hire you to, for this to be your only job. And it was, uh, it was a great experience. It was my first job in politics and uh, I learned more about politics in that job than I have any job since. Uh, there were a lot of interesting dynamics to that race, including that at the time, Houston was the largest city in the country that had never elected a, man, a minority mayor. Uh, and so the previous campaign, six years earlier, had featured an African-American state representative uh, against a, an incumbent Republican who's supported by the business community. And it was a very divisive race for the city. And many leaders in the city got together and decided that the business community uh, should look for a minority mayor in particular, or minority candidate in particular, they would feel enthusiastic about supporting. And so it was an, an uneasy coalition uh, of the establishment business community in Houston and the African American community in Houston that was very enthusiastic about this historic opportunity. Uh, Lee Brown won, and he was elected the mayor of the city of Houston. It was notable for many reasons, including that he was the first African American mayor in the city of Houston. To give you a sense of how far that city had come, in the early 80s, when he was hired as the police chief in Houston, he was the first African American to serve uh, as the police chief in Houston. On his first day in office, the Ku Klux Klan held a rally on the steps of City Hall to protest his hiring. Uh, and about uh, 12 or 14 years later, uh, he was elected mayor of the city. So it was a really, uh, it was a genuinely historic campaign and there was a lot of uh, enthusiasm uh, about the way that he was able to unite that city in a really important way. Uh, but it was a great introduction to uh, local politics in terms of understanding how people 
really uh, consider uh, uh, and take their local politics seriously. As one of the things that I help, uh, helped do was to fill out questionnaires. Uh, every civic association all across the city would send questionnaires, and uh, that, was a, uh, that was a good introduction to politics, too, and understanding <laughs> that our position on whether or not to install road humps in certain city neighborhoods uh, was going to make the difference between getting some votes or not getting some votes. So. so to jump around a little bit, so fast forward a bunch of years, you're working for Barack Obama on the Iowa caucuses. You know, any of the lessons you learned doing city politics, uh, did those carry over into uh, an environment like the caucus? Yeah. Did you uh, see a lot of the same challenges or was it a totally different beast? Mm -hmm. Well, the thing that was so interesting about the Iowa caucus campaign that the Obama campaign run is it was very, there was a conscientious decision that was made to make it a very local Iowa focused effort. And the broader strategy of the Obama campaign was simply that there was a conclusion that, the, that then Senator Obama and his strategists had made, which is that if he were to succeed in the Iowa caucuses, if he were to win the Iowa caucuses, he was very likely gonna be the next president of the United States. And if he didn't, then he probably wasn't. And that meant that he decided to run a campaign that was investing significant time and resources into Iowa. He wanted to hire a staff that would be empowered to run his campaign in Iowa. Uh, and he was gonna spend a lot of time and his own energy uh, building the strongest campaign from the bottom up that he could. And there's a tradition in Iowa politics, uh, particularly when it comes to the Iowa caucuses, of making sure that it's a really uh, grassroots oriented operation. And the Obama campaign had uh, dozens of campaign offices open all across the state. Uh, there, it was driven, it was fueled by volunteers who were ready to knock on doors in their neighborhood, uh, to organize in their community, to volunteer to be precinct captains and to represent the campaign uh, on caucus night. And that kind of grassroots centered uh, uh, campaign is not what you would expect in a national campaign in politics. But when it came to the Obama campaign success in Iowa, uh, that, was the, that was the secret ingredient. And there were a lot of doubts uh, when Senator Obama first came on the national scene. He was somebody who could pack him into large venues and he could give a fiery speech and he could sell lots of books and he could generate a lot of enthusiasm. But the fundamental question of the campaign was, could Senator Obama, who could sell lots of books, actually translate that energy into a viable, sustainable, enthusiastic, uh, modern day political operation? And there, the history books of democratic politics in particular uh, is littered with candidates who could generate a lot of excitement and pack a lot of people in a room, but weren't able to translate that energy into a uh, political operation. Uh, and the Obama administration, or the Obama campaign was very successful uh, in taking that effort and fueling it into an efficient political operation uh, the likes of which I don't, I'm not quite sure that we've seen yeah. before. So, um, you know, as I mentioned earlier, Josh ran the Iowa comms uh, operation for the president, then Senator Obama. Uh, and I wanted you to talk about how you got to that job in a minute, but what was the smallest publication or outlet you can remember that you had to look Barack Obama in the eye and say, boss, you're sitting down with X today? Yeah. Well, we, the, uh, I was, the, the president had the opportunity about a month or so ago to go and do an event in Iowa to talk about uh, some education proposals that he had. And it was the source of a lot of reminiscing for those of us who had worked on his Iowa campaign. And so uh, we talked a lot on the flight out and even in the car when we were in Iowa about the differences between uh, visiting the state as the president of the United States and visiting the state as the candidate. There were many of them. Uh, and the most important difference probably is the number of events that he would do in a single day. Uh, as a candidate for president, it would not at all be uncommon for then Senator Obama to do four or five town hall meetings in one day. So that meant uh, getting up in the morning, you know, driving you know, a sm generally a small distance, he'd stay close to the first event, get up, do a town hall meeting at a junior high, uh, and do, just doing one event actually had a whole series of other uh, activities associated with it. So he would spend time meeting with volunteers from the local community, he would shake their hand and take a picture with them, uh, if there were a local political endorsement that they were trying to get, the local mayor or a local state representative, he'd spend five minutes visiting with them, trying to urge them to come on board the campaign. Uh, then he'd go and do the town hall meeting, and then the other thing that we always asked him to do was to spend five or ten minutes with the, uh, with the local reporter from the local media outlet of that town. So there were all kinds of small towns where we would 
go to the high school, usually would be the biggest place. He'd do a town hall meeting. And then after that, he would step out and spend five or 10 minutes uh, visiting with a local reporter from the local newspaper. And what that guaranteed is we'd always take a picture and that guaranteed that our event would be on the front page of the newspaper, typically accompanied with a picture of the presidential candidate standing next to the reporter as they were talking. And this was a way that we could really make sure that there was a local flavor to our campaign. And when I mean a local flavor, I don't just mean an Iowa flavor. Uh, I mean uh, the flavor of a, of a small Iowa community um, that was represented on the front page of the paper. And so we did that for all four or five events that he would have that day. Yeah. And this was, uh, again, sort of going back to this sense that, there w that Barack Obama was an exciting political figure. He was somebody who could command a lot of attention, sell a lot of books, uh, sell out some large venues to give speeches. The fact that he would spend five minutes with a local reporter, I think sent a re really clear message to people that he was willing to hustle and he was willing to make his case to everybody who'd listen uh, about what he wanted to do with the country and what direction he wanted to take the country. And um, so that served to be a, a, a powerful innovation that distinguished uh, Senator Obama from some of our competitors at the time. Uh, but it also was a stylistic thing that people sort of appreciated that the, the president wasn't just paying attention to the highfalutin national media outlets that were telling the nation about his campaign, but that he was willing to spend time with local reporters who worked at small outlets to tell people in that community uh, about his campaign. Yeah. So I think we may have made history. That may be the first time the term highfalutin has ever been used on this stage, which is very <laughs> exciting. But so obviously tactical and strategic reasons to do that, reflective of the candidate. Does that ethos carry over into the White House as you guys look at how to do media and how to help tell the president's story? So it does in one way. The other thing that we would occasionally do, if the president were going to a larger community, and larger is relative when we're talking about a, a predominantly rural state like Iowa, there were some other uh, communities that had television stations, so Cedar Rapids, it's a relatively small community, but it was its own media market. Uh, the same is true of Sioux City and a couple of others. What we would do if the president was going to Sioux City, for example, we wouldn't just spend time with the local television reporter or local print reporter. He would also do a stand up with all of the local television reporters. And so we'd have the cameras, three or four of them, depending on who, how many could show up. And when Barack Obama was in town, they generally showed up. Uh, and we'd have four of them all lined up. And what we would basically tell the television reporters, you can have one question. And he would stand in one place and he'd look at one camera and answer one question, and then he'd go to the next one and answer one question. And so that was a way that you could do four television interviews uh, in less than 10 minutes. And so this is actually an innovation that we then brought to the White House. Uh, we started something called uh, Live from the White House. And when we, when we have a policy proposal that we can tailor to um, a local media market. So for example, we're rolling out a, um, a, the president's budget we would bring in sometimes six or eight or even 10 local reporters from all across the country. Uh, and we would provide them with information about how their local community would be affected by the president's budget proposal. Uh, you know, this many more students in Cincinnati, Ohio uh, would qualify for a Head Start. Oh, or, uh, uh, you know, this many small businesses in Houston, Texas would uh, get funding through the Small Business Association, whatever it happened to be. Uh, and so what we did was we created something called Life in the White House where we'd invite local television anchors from all across the country to come to the White House. And they could get briefings from senior White House officials about the policy proposal. They could get a tour of the White House from the White House uh, curator. Uh, they would, the highlight of these in, in encounters is always getting to meet Bo and Sonny, the first dogs. Um, and then we would offer them the opportunity to ask two questions of the President of the United States. And then we would allow them to broadcast the news that night from the South Lawn of the White House. And this would guarantee us a substantial footprint on local television stations all across the country because they could go you know, straight to their reporter who people uh, in that local community are used to seeing behind the anchor desk, uh, standing on the South Lawn of the White House with the White House behind them, talking about how they spent their day at the White House and talking about this important policy proposal or this policy priority that we'd identified. And so, that is one way that we took this innovation of spending a little bit of time with a local television reporter uh, in Iowa on the campaign trail uh, and translated that into a national communication strategy in the White House. Cool. So speaking of a national communication strategy in the White House, uh, as I mentioned, Josh has literally worked in the White House from day one, from what, January 20th or 21st, 2009, uh, was the deputy uh, press secretary under both Robert Gibbs and Jay Carney before uh, getting this position. Uh, so you've been there through a time of incredible innovation when it comes to communications. Um, you know, how have these new tools kind of impacted the work you do? Have you seen them as an advantage, a disadvantage, uh, a tool, or a curse? How's that kind of played out? Yeah. 
Well, I think the White House, in the same way that media organizations and even uh, other organizations that are interested in uh, communicating with the American public, have had to deal with the remarkable change uh, in uh, the media that's taken place over the last decade or so. That the, that the, uh, the creation of new media outlets uh, and the use of things like Facebook and Twitter as a tool to communicate with large audiences has really changed the way that we have to think about getting out the president's message. Now, this is something that President Obama, then Senator Obama, was famous for doing as a presidential candidate in 2008 sort of tapping into a lot of these tools to organize his campaign and to raise money. Uh, and it was only later that we came to recognize how important and frankly how powerful those tools could be as a communications tool and not just an organizing tool. And so that meant that we had to rethink a lot of the way that the White House was structured uh, and to put more emphasis and investment on capitalizing on those new technological capabilities as a communications tool. And the truth is this was actually a controversial notion among White House reporters. That if we, you know, we knew that if we did a good job of filming a video of the president, and if we did a, a good job of releasing it at the right time and promoting it in the right way on Facebook, we could get millions of people to watch it. And all of a sudden, without using without interacting with an independent journalist, we could pretty effectively disseminate our message. And to a lot of White House reporters that rightly appreciate the important role that they have in providing accountability, ask tough, asking tough questions to people who are in positions of authority, this was viewed as marginalizing them, or at least posing a significant threat to the position that they have held and the important role that they've long played in our democracy. And so, uh, you know, the release of behind the scenes footage that may be interesting to people, and in some cases it was just even lighthearted. We thought it was a funny moment. And, it, and the moments that were lighthearted and funny were the ones that were most likely to, prom to prompt the, the most powerful reaction online. Uh, also pro prompted a powerful reaction from television reporters at the White House who said, how come you didn't let us have access to that? And I think what has happened, and this was something that we saw a lot of, this kind of friction between the White House press office and the White House press corps, was something that uh, was common to the relationship between the White House and the press corps in the first couple of years that we were at the White House. But I think over the last several years, even media organizations have come to understand that they have to deal with this dramatically changed media environment. Even uh, print outlets have to, to um, collect video footage of the interviews that they that they uh, do. So when the President of the United States does an interview with the Associated Press or with the New York Times, those interviews are now on camera because both the New York Times and the Associated Press have sophisticated strategies for dis disseminating uh, that content. Uh, you know, when the President now does interviews with, uh, with television outlets, uh, you know, with CNN, there's also four or five written stories that go up on the CNN website about that interview. Uh, so media organizations have come to understand that they need to challenge themselves to use all of the available uh, tools at their disposal to promote their interview uh, or to promote their content. So, uh, so I think there are two things. The first is in the same way that we recognize this trend, other media organizations have too. So they're more sympathetic to our plight than they used to be. The second thing that we said at the time, but I think it took a while for reporters to actually start believing us, is that we never viewed the president doing a direct to camera message that we then disseminated on Facebook as a substitute for an interview that the president of the United States would do with a professional journalist. That there is a difference between the content that's disseminated independently by the White House uh, and content that is generated by an independent news organization. That the expectation that the American people have is that yes, we want as much access and, and information as we can get about what's happening at the White House, but we understand that there's a difference between information that's put out from the government and information that is created uh, by an independent news organization. That an independent news organization is going to uh, put their own filter, that they're gonna independently evaluate that content, uh, that they are going to uh, ask tough questions and that they are gonna hold the president accountable. Uh, and uh, as media organizations came to understand 
that what we were doing online and what we were doing on Twitter and Facebook and YouTube uh, was not a substitute for what they were doing. Uh, the, that, the, that the unease about the strategy uh, ebbed quite a bit. Yeah. So getting down to brass tacks, were you for or against between two firms? <laughs> I was, uh, <laughs> that's a good example. Uh, this feels a little like between two Doesn't firms it? in yeah, some ways. No, no. Yeah. <laughs> Slightly less funny, yeah, but well, we're going to do our best. We're we? trying. <laughs> um, but between two firms is a great example of that. that there, there, there was no... That was never going to be a substitute for a serious interview that the president would do with CNN uh, or with the Wall Street Journal or some other, uh, or even you know even something like the Huffington Post that is a serious news organization that uh, uh, that um, uh, you know that, that that distributes its content online. It's a it's a news organization that wouldn't have succeeded 20 years ago just because of the technological innovation. Uh, that that between two ferns was never going to be a tool to um, to replace that. Uh, but what it could do is it could augment it, and it could get the attention of people who otherwise wouldn't pay attention to an interview uh, in the Wall Street Journal. But they would watch uh, the president hamming it up with Zach Galifianakis, and they would think to themselves, well, maybe I should check out this healthcare.gov thing. Maybe it's actually going to work for me. Um, and, uh, and it did. And we actually, uh, during that time period, we, nothing drove more people to healthcare.gov than that interview. All the links that we put out on Facebook, uh, all of the other interviews that we did through other news organizations that included healthcare.gov, the link that, or the, 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 uh, the tool that sort of generated the most direct views to healthcare.gov was actually that interview. Cool. So uh, we can ask about two more questions probably, and then we'll go to, uh, you know, actually real questions from the people that okay. <laughs> have more substantive things. <laughs> we can talk about what other people want yeah, to Yeah, exactly about. right. Um, so to, to go a little bit more high-minded, I guess. So mm -hmm. uh, you grew up in Missouri. Uh, you went to college in Texas, both bastions of American liberalism. <laughs> um, can you talk a little bit, especially as we head into um, Parents Weekend, about kind of how where you grew up shaped your values and your approach to, to your job and kind of maybe the role your folks played in that? Yeah. Well, as I mentioned earlier, I, I didn't grow up in a particularly political family. Uh, my parents weren't uh, knocking on doors on the weekends. They didn't make financial contributions to campaigns. I do have a vivid memory of going with my parents to the, uh, to the voting booth uh, and standing with them as they were casting their ballot. I think they did that because they wanted to uh, send a message to me even as a, as a kid that um, fulfilling your civic responsibilities uh, by voting is, uh, is a priority and something that you should spend time, to doing, spend time doing when you have the opportunity to cast a ballot. But I do, the, one of the reasons that there, there are many reasons that I really enjoy politics, but some of them are influenced by the way that I was raised. And uh, Brent and I, before we did this, had this conversation, we had the opportunity to go and spend a few minutes watching the uh, Harvard men's basketball team practice. And my dad was a basketball coach when I was growing up. Uh, he was a coach uh, at uh, a couple of different schools in the Kansas City area. And... Uh, I was always interested in sports growing up, and it infused this appreciation for competition. And uh, for a variety of reasons, I was never going to become a professional athlete, although being a starting pitcher for the Kansas City Royals would have been a great career option <laughs> had it been available to me. Uh, unfortunately, it was not. Uh, but one of the things that I like about politics is it is a competition of ideas. We have an opportunity to go out into, in, in our democracy, to go out and make a public, aggressive case for what it is that we believe in and what we think the country should be about, and what our priorities as a nation should be. We're a very diverse country. We're a huge country. There are hundreds of millions of people who live here. But we can have a spirited debate, debate and a competition about what we should make, what our priorities should be. Uh, and sort of that sense that we could go and, um, and advocate for something that we believe in, uh, in a competitive atmosphere, was something that really appealed to me. Uh, and it still does. Um, and in some ways, this is the, the reason that I like the job that I have now. Um, one of the things I don't like about the job that I have now is one of my primary responsibilities is to, or one, part of my job description is to watch the Sunday shows every Sunday uh, and see what people are saying. I know that that's likely to come up in Monday's briefing, so I'll spend some time uh, at least uh, fast forwarding through the Sunday shows. And sometimes I'll be watching the Sunday shows and I'll think to myself, what that person said is not true. That's not a good argument for them to make. That's not a fair characterization of our position. Or they're leaving out a pretty important fact that totally undermines the argument that they're making. And rather than getting riled up watching my television screen and being tempted to throw my shoe at the screen, 
one day it dawned on me, I, th I thought to myself, actually, there is something I can do about this. <laughs> Tomorrow, I can go and point out the flaws in this person's argument, and everybody's going to notice, because I'm going to do it standing in front of the White House seal uh, with uh, 40 reporters in front of me. Uh, and that is a remarkable opportunity, and one that I don't take for granted at all. And even on the days when I get a little tired, uh, or feel a little sleep deprived, or feel like the, the, the there, there even a, there's even the occasional day when I feel like the, the, the press is not being as fair as I would like them to be. Um, I don't lose sight of the unique opportunity that I have to influence that process. And I think a lot of that goes back to the uh, sort of this appreciation for competition that I learned. I think the other thing that I bring to this job that, um, that other people in Washington have noticed is that you know that, that people will often accuse me of being Midwest nice, and <laughs> I do try to be polite and have the kind of manners that my that my mom spent a lot of time teaching me. Yeah. But there also is this sense that I think is quite common in the Midwest um, is this sense that we can go and have a spirited debate. We don't have to agree on everything, but it doesn't mean we have to be enemies. We don't have to. Um, get so mad at each other that we're not going to spend any time together, uh, that we're, we're, despite our differences, we're not going to lose sight of our common values, that we're all in this together. And there's something very, there's a Midwestern ethos to that. And, uh, and I try to bring a little bit of that to the political debate, but I also try to bring a little bit of that to the press briefings as well. That if I, I can get into spirited exchanges with reporters, but we can continue to be collegial and we can be respectful, uh, both on camera when we're doing it in front of other people, uh, if I'm answering a tough question or if I have a pretty stern rebuttal to the uh, supposition that you've offered, uh, that I can be respectful uh, in having that exchange. And, uh, and even, you know, even when that exchange is over, we can continue to have a, a collegial uh, working relationship. And even if, you know, even if you represent a news outlet uh, that I often don't agree with, uh, it's not going to prevent us from coordinating with you and cooperating with you, giving you a chance to do your job to cover the White House. Uh, and for us to make uh, you know, our case uh, about how you should um, characterize what's happening at the White House. Great, so we'll do one more question and then uh, we are gonna do um, questions from the audience. So I think the students know the drill, but there's four mics up here. So if folks wanna start queuing up or thinking about what they wanna ask, that'd be fantastic. So kind of last question um, uh, from me, um, you know, and I'll take a point of privilege and, and point out something that Josh would not point out about himself. I looked online um, in the um, vessel of all human knowledge that is Wikipedia uh, before we did this <laughs> and realized that, so the average tenure of someone in Josh's job going back to the beginning of the Clinton administrations is just under two years. Uh, these are very demanding jobs. Uh, Josh has only been in this job for a little over a year but has been in the White House on a daily basis for seven years now. Mm -hmm. um, Almost. So, um, you know, look, I, I think that for those of you that have worked in and around the type of work that we've been lucky enough to do, you'll know that just the, the commitment and sacrifice that him and his family have made to do that is, is something I think that's incredible. Uh, it also means two things. It means one, Josh is probably very tired. Um, <laughs> it also means that you have a, a very unique perspective on kind of where we've been and where we're going. So as you uh, look at the next 15 months uh, heading into uh, whoever will be the next president, what do you kind of see as the challenges for the president and the administration uh, in order to both stay relevant, as a lot of people put it, but also mm -hmm. to get the things done that you all are trying to mm -hmm. accomplish? Well, the truth is, Brent, people have been asking me for more than a year about what we're going to do to make sure the president stays relevant. <laughs> yeah. And um, whatever we're doing right now seems to be working just fine. <laughs> so I think we'll probably keep doing that. Uh, the president's approach to this is that in the same way that I feel like I had this really unique opportunity uh, to contribute to our political debate and try to advance a set of values and priorities that I genuinely believe in, uh, uh, the president feels that way too, given his responsibilities. And he recognizes that he's got another 15 months or so in office. And he is committed to squeezing every last drop of opportunity uh, that he has before him. And so I think you can expect to see the president continue to use every element at his, uh, of his executive authority and his, at his disposal to try to move the country uh, in the direction that he thinks is best. And there's certainly no secret that the legislative process right now is quite dysfunctional. And that's unfortunate because I do think that if there were uh, 
Republicans, a, a substantial number of reporters, uh, enough Republicans uh, in the Congress that were willing to sit down with the Democratic President of the United States and say, we're not gonna fold on our conservative uh, principles, number one. Uh, number two, we are though aware that the American people in their wisdom have elected a Democrat to be in charge of the White House and Republicans to be in charge of the United States Congress. Uh, they don't expect us to just come up here and spend the next two years bickering along party lines. They actually expected us to get some things done for them. So let's sit down and figure out how you can uh, adhere to the democratic principles that the American people put you in office to fight for. Let's talk about the conservative principles that we've been elected to fight for, but let's figure out where the common ground lies and let's try to advance it. Uh, and that may require us to compromise. It may require you as President of the United States to sign a couple of bills into law that you don't, uh, where you don't agree with 100% of the legislative language that's been drafted, but you can support the spirit of what's included here. I think we'd be able to get a lot done if that was the kind of environment that we had in Washington, D.C. Uh, it's not really the environment that we've had in Washington, D.C. for the last several years, uh, unfortunately. But I do think there, there are some opportunities. The, the, uh, I think the opportunity that you're going to hear a lot more about, not just in the next couple of weeks, but over the next few months, will be criminal justice reform. That there is genuine bipartisan agreement in, on Capitol Hill that the justice system as it's currently structured uh, is not the most effective use of taxpayer dollars. Uh, it, there are significant questions of fairness and justice in our criminal justice system about whether that's being carried out uh, appropriately. There are also questions about whether or not the way our criminal justice system is currently implemented about whether that's the best way to keep our, our community safe. And that if we wanna drive down recidivism rates, uh, that there are some things that we can do to help people who have served time in our criminal justice system be better positioned to be more effective contributors to our, um, to our country and to communities across the country. So I think there's, that is one of the few areas where I think there's a genuine opportunity for bipartisan agreement. Uh, the president's team has recently concluded the negotiation of the Trans-Pacific Partnership. Uh, this is a trade agreement with 11 other countries in the Asia Pacific. And um, earlier this summer to assist the completion of these negotiations, Congress worked to pass in bipartisan fa fashion um, trade promotion authority, essentially that would ensure that any trade agreement that the president concludes would have a process in Congress where it could be quickly considered. This will require a substantial number of Republicans to work with the Democratic president to get this done. Uh, but there's some optimism that we should be able to get that done uh, at some point in the future. Uh, so I think those, in, in terms of areas of bipartisan agreement, you know, we're hopeful that those are, are some areas. There are also some basics that we have to get done. Uh, the budget, we need a new budget to be passed uh, the second week in December. Uh, the full faith and credit of the United States will be at risk if Congress doesn't vote to increase the debt limit here in the next few weeks. Uh, hopefully they will do that. Uh, the transportation bill is uh, scheduled to expire uh, at the end of October. Uh, so that needs to be replenished. The transportation fund needs to be replenished. And uh, the XM Bank, the Export Import Bank, uh, that supports uh, thousands of jobs across the country and has a long tradition of bipartisan support, has actually lapsed uh, over the summer because many Republicans have come out to oppose it. Uh, we're hopeful that we can build the bi bipartisan majority that we need to, to reauthorize the bank and get it up and running again. So there are some basics that we need to take care of. But there are a couple of opportunities over the next 15 months, at least in the legislative process, where we should be able to uh, uh, make some progress. Good deal. So we're gonna go to questions from the audience. Uh, just a couple of reminders. Please uh, state uh, your name, uh, where you are in the college. Are you uh, an undergrad, grad student, community member? Uh, uh, please be kind to Josh. He's not used to answering questions in public forums. <laughs> um, and then uh, please make sure you ask a question. Uh, this is something you should say at the beginning of your briefings every day. It should end in a question mark. Mm -hmm. So with those ground rules, uh, we'll start down here, uh, stage left. Hi, Mr. Runners, thank you for coming. My name is David, I'm a junior at the college. Uh, I'm a Democrat from Houston, and so I was wondering what sort of advice you have for any Democrats thinking of starting a political career in a Republican area or state, or any Republicans thinking of starting a political career in a Democratic area or state? Mm -hmm. uh, that's a good question, David. I, the, the thing that worked great for me is I volunteered on a campaign. And Houston has an interesting process. They're off year elections, so the Houston mayor uh, will serve a two year term uh, and they're limited to three terms. So every six years, typically there's an open seat race for 
uh, the mayor's office. Um, uh, mayor Parker's doing an excellent job there. I'm not sure I exactly so. if she's in her second or third term now, but she's a fellow Rice graduate and uh, is doing really, really good work for the city there. Uh, but getting involved in a local election in Houston is a great way to get involved in politics. Uh, the second thing that I would say is it doesn't have to necessarily be the mayor's race. Uh, working on a city council race is a really good way to get to know people in your community. Um, and those races are technically nonpartisan, uh, as many races are, but uh, the city of Houston is uh, predominantly democratic. So there are certainly other democratic officials and other uh, young Democrats like yourself that you can get to know. And like I said, uh, campaigns are a genuine meritocracy. Uh, that if you show up, uh, if you're an effective volunteer, they're uh, not just gonna ask you to um, uh, make yard signs, but if you do a really good job of that, you're conscientious about your work, uh, then they're quickly gonna find you some other uh, things that they are gonna want you to do, and that's gonna create some new opportunities for you. So uh, what I often tell people is if you're a young person that's interested in getting involved in politics, you can do no better uh, than going and working on a campaign. The other thing that you can consider doing uh, is to move to Washington, D.C. and get a job on Capitol Hill. Uh, there are 435 uh, uh, members of the House of Representatives and another uh, 100 senators. Uh, a majority of them uh, are Republicans, of course, uh, but there are still hundreds of Democrats that you can work for, <laughs> work for in Washington. Uh, and uh, that can be a great opportunity. Young people who want to go and get a start in politics uh, can not just learn a lot about the legislative process, um, but I've observed uh, that young people can have uh, a pretty good time working on Capitol Hill. <laughs> So, um, you know, at being a Democrat from Texas, um, you can certainly go to, you know, my advice for that is to go and uh, start with the Democrats who represent uh, Houston in Congress and start there. And they're always going to be interested in, um, in, a, in a hometown person that they can bring into the office. So that'd be a good place to start. Great. So we're going to draw a box. We'll go uh, up here. Hi, my name is uh, Moshe. I'm a researcher uh, studying social sciences and uh, a lecturer at the college. Um, and I guess uh, your job has a, a lot of responsibilities. Every word you say, every question you answer affects the way that uh, the average American citizen thinks and, and frames a lot of issues. And I guess that puts a lot of responsibility on, uh, on, on the decision you make for what questions to answer and how to frame your answers. And I'm wondering if you could tell us a little bit about the, the process maybe behind the scenes for how you make those kinds of decisions. Mm -hmm. uh, that's a good question, Moshe. The, the, well, I have a couple of principles that I abide by. The first one is that I don't guess. Because if I guess the answer to a question and guess wrong, uh, it can sow a lot of confusion. Uh, and it is the best way to undermine my own credibility is to get it wrong. So I work really hard to make sure that if I'm going to give an answer, that it's the right one. Uh, and sometimes that means if people are asking me a question, in order to just be constructive, what I will do is they may ask me about a topic. And if I don't understand the, if I don't know the answer to the specific question that they're asking, at least what I can do is I can articulate the administration's general position on that issue uh, and then promise to follow up with them on the particular angle that they're asking about. The second thing is, and this is in some ways the most challenging part of the job, is there is an totally unfair, but at the same time reasonable assumption that people make about the person who's standing behind the microphone at the podium in the White House briefing room, which is if you ask them a question about something that they've never heard of before, then people are inclined to believe that nobody at the White House has ever heard of that before. Uh, and that, that can be difficult too. So if people are asking me about something that I've never heard of before, I try not to let on that I've never heard of it before. <laughs> Um, because generally, if it's at all relevant to uh, the country, then somebody at the White House is working on it. I just may not have run into that person that day. But the process that we use to prepare me for the briefing is, a, is I have a staff of five or six people who are responsible for uh, a range of domestic issues. So I've got somebody who's in charge of the economy, somebody who does both criminal justice and the environment, somebody else who does uh, health care and education, somebody else who does Homeland Security, they're each responsible for their issue area. Uh, and what they will do uh, before I begin preparing for the briefing is they will be aware of any announcements that we're making in their area today all across the administration. Even if it's not an, uh, an announcement that's coming from the White House, it may be an announcement that the Department of Energy, for example, is making. That could be relevant to the daily briefing. The second is they need to be aware of 
what uh, any criticism that we may be getting about our policy in their area that is newsworthy that day. And then they need to be aware of what's in the news uh, in terms of what was covered in the, in the newspapers overnight or what may have been covered in the nightly news or the network news the night before. And they can essentially take that information. And then I guess the other outlet that they have is actually their ongoing communications with reporters. Uh, that's the benefit of having the BlackBerry with them. Uh, and they have a sense of what our reporters are likely to ask. And so I will spend about 30 to 45 minutes each day with the domestic policy uh, spokespeople in my office, going through with them the questions that I'm likely to, ask based, likely to be asked based on what's in the news, what announcements we've made, and what our reporters at the White House are interested in. Uh, and then I run a similar process with the spokespeople at the National Security Council who handle the range of foreign policy issues. Uh, and over the course of about an hour and a half, that's a pretty good way for me to prepare uh, for about an hour long briefing. Great. Philip Top. Thanks so much for being here. My name is Caroline Turbo. I'm a sophomore in the college from North Carolina. Um, I'm wondering if you ever feel like CJ Craig um, and if you could tell us a story of maybe one of the roughest days or most memorable days that you served as uh, press secretary at the White House. Yeah, uh, there are a lot of them. Um, and yes, there are a lot of ways I feel like uh, CJ Craig. Um, she, um, she illustrated, I think, in the, in the body of her character, uh, the, w the way that she had to balance the demands of this job. Uh, there is a responsibility that I have first and foremost to the President of the United States as his spokesperson to be an advocate uh, and to be a communicator for him. That's my first responsibility. But I will not be an effective advocate for him if the people to whom I'm advocating uh, don't put a lot of investment in my relationship. So I also find myself frequently uh, at the White House being an advocate for the White House press corps. Uh, and making sure that they're getting access, that they're getting their questions answered, that we're doing all that we can as an organization to help them understand what we're doing and why we're doing it. Uh, and that's a responsibility that the president has, not just to White House reporters, but to the American people. Uh, and in some ways, White House reporters are the advocate for the American people, and uh, so the president feels the special responsibility that he, that he has uh, for them. So let me think if I can uh, tell you a good example of uh, a story that felt a little like from the West Wing. Um, the second day that I did the White House briefing as the press secretary, the, and this will highlight what Moshe was asking about too. Uh, I was asked if the president had made any calls with foreign leaders to talk about the situation in Ukraine. I believe is what it was. And uh, I quickly dismissed the question, saying, no, the president didn't uh, have uh, uh, conversations with any world leaders about the situation in Ukraine today. Later that day, we put out a, a written readout of a conversation that the president had with a European leader about our counter ISIL campaign. And all of a sudden, all, uh, the, this is sort of the modern environment, there are all kinds of tweets from White House reporters saying the press, sec the press secretary today told us the president didn't make any calls to foreign leaders. And so I went back the next day and had a, what started out as a private conversation with some reporters who cover the White House and were sending these tweets, were me making clear that I'd been asked a very direct question on the topic of Ukraine about whether or not the president made calls to foreign leaders uh, uh, on that topic. Uh, and um, so what, it, what I learned from that is I now overshare when it comes to the president's conversations that I know will later become public. Uh, and it illustrates how there can be quite a difference in the intention of the question and the intention of the answer, uh, of the person who's answering the question. If I had said, yes, by the way, the president did call Chancellor Merkel in Germany today, but they didn't talk about Ukraine, that wouldn't have been a very clear way for me to try to answer that person's question about uh, the president's engagement on the situation in Ukraine. So I had good intentions, and I think most reporters recognize that. Uh, but I did conclude from that experience that I needed to do, uh, that, that I would be more effective uh, if I sort of overshared and spent more time explaining exactly who the president was calling, because there's a particular sensitivity uh, about those calls. Thanks. So mm -hmm. I'm gonna interject real quick, because yep. <clears throat> I think this would make a great West Wing episode. Okay. Um, so what did you end up talking about the day that you thought you would be talking about President Xi visiting the White House? And how long had you spent preparing for the President Xi visit? Mm -hmm. 
Well, that's a, that is a, a good question. The, um, this, the last week in September was a day that we had noted on our calendar, on our internal plan, planning calendar for quite some time. This is, um, this is the, that Wednesday was the day that Pope Francis visited the White House. Uh, so it was a, a significant day. Uh, then the next Thursday night, President Xi visited uh, Washington, D.C. and had a state visit with the president at the White House on Friday. There was a big state dinner that night. And then on Sunday, uh, President Obama traveled to the United Nations to address the United Nations. So this was, a, uh, this was a time frame in which we knew the president would be making a lot of news. Many of those of you who follow politics also know that on that Friday, uh, John Boehner made the surprise announcement that he was uh, retiring from the Congress and giving up uh, the speakership of the House of Representatives. Uh, so the president's news conference, where he stood in the Rose Garden next to the president of China, the president took two questions from White House reporters, as is the custom when he's meeting with a world leader, uh, and both questions were not focused on our relationship with China, with cybersecurity, with the South China Sea, with the valuation of the, of the Chinese currency, with the status of the Trans-Pacific Partnership uh, Agreement, with our work on China to try to reach an agreement to prevent Iran from obtaining a nuclear weapon, both questions were about what the president was gonna do with the next speaker of the House of Representatives. So there is a way that uh, real world events uh, and even real world politics can, um, can intervene and disrupt the best laid plans for even the most high profile story. Great, down here. Hi, uh, my name is Ben Bolger. I'm a Harvard alum and graduate student from Michigan. And um, the West Wing is a very small uh, environment, and there's a, not a lot of workspace, especially for reporters. There's some workstations, but not that many. In earlier generations, it was pretty clear who is the national press, New York Times, CNN. Uh, what are your thoughts about the future as we get more digital media, as there's smaller outlets that have a bigger reach? What do you think the national press corps will look like? I, I know that the Correspondents mm -hmm. Association kind of patrols who gets the spaces. Yes, thank uh, goodness, because that is not a fight I need. <laughs> <laughs> but what, what are your thoughts on you know, what the traveling press and the press corps that greet you in the briefing will look like as digital media changes uh, yeah. in the future? Yeah, uh, that's a good question. And I think it's, it's difficult to predict exactly what that's gonna look like. There are a lot of news organizations that do have a wide reach that are able to do that without having a daily presence at the White House. And it means they cover the White House in a different way than a major news organization that has dedicated the time and resources to covering the White House every single day. What we have concluded internally at the White House is that if we wanted to do an effective job of communicating with the American public, we can't limit ourselves to engaging with only those new news organizations that have a presence at the White House every day. So the president has to go and do Between Two Ferns. The president has to go and do an interview with Vice News. Um, and we are looking for new ways to engage news outlets that don't regularly come and cover the White House every day, but still have a significant reach. Uh, because the fact is that people, you know, that uh, get their news through, uh, you know, Vice News, for example, uh, aren't necessarily the same people who are reading the Wall Street Journal every day. And so that is not a slight to the Wall Street Journal. That's not a criticism of them. They're still a widely read, influential news organization. And we take them seriously, and we spend a lot of time trying to influence their coverage. But we're missing out on an opportunity if we don't also spend some time trying to engage news organizations like Vice News. And... You know, what impact that has for the traveling White House press corps, I think remains to be seen. Uh, but it certainly has already had an impact on the kind of strategy that the White House devises to communicate with the American public. Great, down here. Hello, um, my name is Carrie, and I'm an MPP student here in Kennedy School. And uh, in fact, this semester, I'm playing the role of communication officer in a uh, mock campaign team in one of my classes offering here. <laughs> so I'm really curious, like, what is the biggest challenges you have experienced in, in your position, and how did you solve it? Yeah. Thank you. Well, the, uh, thanks for the question. I, I think one of the biggest challenges, well, let me answer, let, ask that, answer that question two different ways. The first is, the, when you're working at the White House, there's the expectation that the White House is pretty much involved in everything, even if we're not. Uh, and so ju just about every major story uh, that comes up, uh, there is an eager, immediate need for a reaction from the White House. And when you're working on a, on a, on a campaign, even if it's a presidential campaign, you have the luxury of saying, well, we're not really gonna comment on that because we're not really involved. Uh, it's very rare for us to be, have that, that position at the White House. Um, 
I, I, in fact, I still remember vividly the first major news story that, um, that uh, occurred while President Obama was in office that didn't elicit the immediate uh, demand for a White House reaction. Uh, and that story took place in the summer of 2009 uh, when Michael Jackson died. That was the first major worldwide story that there was an immediate uh, uh, thirst for the White House point of view. Though two days later, there was a protracted discussion in the White House briefing room about why the White House didn't put out a statement from President Obama about the death of Michael Jackson. <laughs> so, um, so I was wrong at the time that people didn't really, that this, we'd finally found a story that, that people didn't care about the White House uh, with regard to. Uh, I was wrong about that. Um, so that's the first thing. And that's sort of something that's unique to campaigns, which is it, it's easy to sort of separate yourself from them. I would say the biggest challenge on a day-to-day -day basis uh, at the White House is trying to determine uh, and make good decisions about when to involve the President of the United States personally. What's the kind of story that demands uh, the President's involvement? How do you make a decision about whether or not the President's gonna go before the cameras uh, and address the country or at least address the White House press corps to take on an issue? And let me give you a serious example. Uh, and the, after the shooting in Oregon a couple of weeks ago, uh, it became clear from the initial reports that this was likely to be a pretty severe situation. The community college was so remote that the closest FBI field office was, was a couple of hours away. So it took some time for the White House to get um, a reliable account of what exactly had happened there and how many people's lives had been lost uh, or otherwise affected in, through an injury. And there was a question about whether or not we would put, have the president go and make a public statement because it's become routine that we see these public shootings occur in a variety of locations, whether it's a military recruiting station in Tennessee or a community college campus in a remote part of Oregon or an elementary school in Connecticut. And time and time again, we see these kinds of incidents and it's become a routine response. And that's something that the president himself lamented. We did ultimately decide that the president should be heard on this given the number of lives affected. We decided that that would be an important thing for him to publicly acknowledge. Uh, and um, I think the president at first, when he received the recommendation that we thought he should say something publicly about it, wanted to spend some time considering whether or not he should say something public. He, I think he was feeling, uh, he had to answer the question about whether or not he wanted to give in to that routine. Uh, because I think, it, as was evident from anybody who saw his remarks afterwards, he's fed up with that routine. Uh, he's tired of it, he's frustrated by it. Uh, and it represents an abject political failure on the part of our political system that we don't have in place some common sense laws that would make these kinds of crimes less likely. There's no bill that we're gonna pass that's gonna prevent every violent crime. But there are some common sense things that we can do. And the fact that institutionally, uh, that Congress is not able to get them done uh, is a source of great frustration to the president who is responsible for the safety and security of the American people uh, because people are losing their lives as a result. Uh, and the president did ultimately decide that this was a story he wanted to be heard on uh, and he did make a public statement and he did make this observation himself uh, that he was fed up with this process, that there is a routine thing where he comes out and delivers the statement and the press corps spends a couple of days lamenting this innocent loss of life and then we all go back to our, our lives. And um, the president you know, was pretty forthright in saying that he was gonna use as much power as he could to try to change the political conversation in this country because there are common sense things that we can do to make those crimes less likely, uh, to keep guns out of the hands of those who shouldn't have them uh, wh without undermining the basic constitutional rights of law-abiding Americans. And that's something, uh, over the next 15 months, I, uh, I'm confident that the president's gonna spend a lot of time working on that as well. Cool. So we're bumping up against time. If you guys are okay with it, we'll, we'll sneak in one more question. Okay. Uh, and then we'll, two, two? Mm -hmm. We get two more questions. Oh, thank you. Wow. Yeah, embarrassment, Harvard time, seven more <laughs> minutes. Uh, up here. Uh, my name is Jamar and I'm at the Harvard Graduate School of Education. I was wondering, uh, for those, I asked this question in light of those of us who want to have a publicly visible role within politics. How did you transition from between having a, an intrinsic role in administrations to being, to having a very public persona now where 
it could be openly scrutinized. Like, did you, I don't know, stay up late watching Jay Carney videos, or <laughs> did you just wake up and say, "I'll be great today"? <laughs> what exactly did you go to prepare for? It? Just outside the, ask, the outside the scope of what you've done, just from a career standpoint. Yeah. Should, should we get Natalie up here to answer? That <laughs> she can vouch for my late night television viewing habits for sure. <laughs> yeah. um, one of the benefits, one of the advantages that I had in getting this job, just to be totally frank about it, was as Brent mentioned earlier, I was the deputy both to Robert Gibbs and to Jay Carney, who were my two predecessors for President Obama. And that meant that I spent five years watching the White House briefing every day. And that familiarity with the process is something that gave me a real advantage in taking this job. Having an understanding of what kinds of questions reporters were likely to ask, how reporters were likely to react to individual answers, understanding how answers as they were given would later be filtered through the reporting process, how that would show up on the nightly news or how that would show up in uh, the print coverage of the White House the next day. Yeah. Uh, and having a familiarity with all of that uh, gave me a real advantage taking this job. The other advantage that I had uh, is that I worked uh, in the office, uh, in the White House, uh, in the press office as the deputy that was closest to the White House briefing room. And this was an, an area that White House reporters have regular access to. Uh, and that meant that I was often the person of first resort for a lot of reporters. That if they were desperate to confirm a breaking news event, if they were really angry about being scooped on something, if they felt like they were uh, sort of at a quandary, at a loss for how to begin their reporting on a story, if they were just curious about something that had happened at the White House, um, that, that I would often be the first person that they would turn to. And that gave me a real opportunity to develop a personal relationship with a lot of the people that you see on TV at the White House briefing. And that meant that I didn't have to develop my personal relationship on live national television in a heated political debate with a lot of reporters, that these are people, by and large, that I already have a, a relationship with. And that makes it a little easier for us to have a more human, authentic conversation. The, I will say that the one thing that I learned from watching the White House briefing every day for five years is that at a very fundamental level, it's not on the level. That it, it's not a place to go and have a debate. That if my goal walking through the door of the briefing room is to take my binder up there and stand behind that podium and win the debate with reporters that day, I'm definitely gonna lose. There is, um, reporters are allowed, and this is part of our process, and this is part of what makes for a healthy democracy. Reporters are, asked to, are, are not just allowed, their job description requires that they come in and ask unfair questions, that they ask the tough questions, that they ask the question that is skewed toward the most skeptical view of what we're trying to do. Uh, and the best thing that I can do is not go and try to win an argument with a reporter that's understandably skeptical of what we're trying to do, but to actually go and try to make the most affirmative, compelling case for what it is we're doing and why we're doing it, and to describe the values that animate that decision. Uh, and if I can do that, that is the best way for me to represent the, uh, the administration to the American public. It's also the, the best way for me to be true to what my job description is. The president walks into the Oval Office every day with a set of priorities that he has set for himself and he's set for the country and he's fighting for them. And my job is to help the American people and the reporters who cover the White House understand exactly what those policies are, exactly, exactly what those priorities are, and why the president has set those as his priorities. Uh, and that's what I try to do every day in the briefing. All right, thank you. Thank you. So no pressure on our last question. That would have been a great ending. That would that have been a good ending, wouldn't it? Powerful. So um, I'll have to come up with another one for the ending. I'm, I'm then, no I guess. doubt. So we'll uh, go up here for our last question. Thank you, Mr. Ernest. My name is Cameron Consri. I'm a sophomore here at the college, originally from, from Southern California. Now, of course, every government, and, and particularly uh, the president and the administration of, of our country, there are national security priorities, uh, domestic policies that have to be, for some time, kept under wraps before they're ready to be uh, disseminated to the public. However, when President Obama came into office, one of his main goals was to be, uh, in his own words, the most transparent administration uh, in the history of the country. And, and many journalists today would argue that that hasn't been fulfilled yet. In fact, mm -hmm. just a few months ago, a, a large grouping of journalists uh, sent uh, a letter to yourself and to the administration saying that they wished there were more transparency, more openness from your office 
and the administration as a whole. Is that an unfair criticism of the president's administration and, and the work that your office has done? Mm -hmm. Or where do you think they're going wrong there? Yeah. This is a great example of what I was just talking about. So I'm glad that you, <laughs> I'm glad that you asked about this. Uh, and, I'm, and this is a perfect example, so I appreciate you bringing it up. Here's why it's the perfect example. Yes, it's totally unfair. By almost any measure, the Obama administration is the most transparent administration in history. That's a very controversial notion among reporters. I can feel people tweeting about it right now. <laughs> it's that controversial. But uh, on any measure, uh, and the best, you know, the best example that we often use is the fact that every quarter, the White House will put out a list uh, of just about every single person who came to the White House gate to do business at the White House. Uh, that doesn't seem like a particularly revolutionary thing, but it is something we post available on the website. It's available every quarter. People can go and see who came in, what day they came in, and who they came to see, and why they were there. Uh, and this is a measure of holding people in power accountable. The reason this is significant is the previous administration actually went to the Supreme Court to prevent the release of these records that they did not feel that they had an obligation to, prevent, to present to the public who was participating in the administration's, that administration's energy task force. Uh, and in fact, this administration actually feels a responsibility to present that information voluntarily uh, every quarter for the American public to see it. There are now, I, I believe we're past now, four million records that are available online uh, that people can go to the White House website and see today um, what sort of business uh, has been done at the White House in the past. Um, so that's how I make my case, and that's the affirmative case, and it's only one example of the kind of transparency that President Obama is committed to. At the same time, if there were, were any reporter, any independent reporter who was committed to covering the White House, if they ever walk into my office and say, you know, Josh, you're doing a great job of telling us all that we need to know about what's happening at the White House, <laughs> they're not doing their job. That is a fundamental dereliction of their duty, to press the administration for more access and for more information and to look at what we're doing with a skeptical eye and ask tough questions to try to get to the root of the story and verify that the case that I'm making is actually the right case, both in terms of the facts, but also in terms of uh, our priorities. And so that's a good illustration of how it's not fair for somebody to make that claim. But if somebody doesn't make that claim and doesn't have that sort of perspective, then they're forfeiting their responsibility to hold the administration accountable. So the fact is, there's built-in friction between the White House press corps and the White House press office. And that friction is good. That friction is evidence that both sides are doing their job. Because the other thing is this, if I were to sit back and say, what do you wanna know about today? I'll just tell you all the secrets. Uh, that certainly would have some implications for our national security. Uh, but it also would have some implications for your ability and the American public's ability to understand what our priorities are. If we just told you everything, it'd be hard for you to discern exactly what's most important. So, uh, and it would be hard for us to make our most affirmative case about why what we're doing is important because we know it's gonna be subject to not just a lot of scrutiny by independent journalists, but by a lot of criticism from our opponents. So if I wanna make the best possible case, I need to um, be protective of the way that information is transmitted to the American public. Uh, but that is not an excuse for withholding information that the American public has a legitimate right to know. Uh, and it's understandable that people with the same values and the same goals might have a difference of opinion uh, about what uh, information falls in which category. Uh, so the, way, the thing that I always tell people who say, well, geez, it seems like you guys have a terrible relationship with your press corps. The thing that I always tell people is if there's ever a day that somebody says that they have a great relationship uh, with the administration is the day that they're not doing their job. It's also the way that I can assure you that George Washington's press secretary got into fights with the uh, press corps. Uh, uh, John Adams' press secretary got into fights with the White House press corps and, uh, and on through history. Uh, that that's an element of our democracy that is critically important to, um, uh, to our success, uh, not just as a democracy, but as a country. Thank you. That, that was a, a pretty good way to end, too. So two quick things. Yeah. <laughs> One, uh, I know neither of us ever thought we'd be sitting on a stage at Harvard University. It's kind of crazy. Um, so I feel like you need to, you, you get the last word to talk okay. about something you feel personally passionately about. Uh, so what's your prediction for the Royals game tonight? <laughs> <laughs> uh, my prediction is that uh, Jordano Ventura is going to go more than six innings and the Royals are going to win. So we're, we're counting on that. Okay, everybody, you heard it here first. That's so, right, I heard it here um, first. I hope I did not jinx them. That's, that would be terrible. Exactly. Quick. We'll knock yeah, on some wood so, here. Uh, okay. Well, for, thank you all for coming and spending some time in the afternoon. Thank you, Josh. Um,
Thank you for indulging my inner Charlie Rose. And uh, please, uh, if you don't participate in events here at the IOP, check out everything we have to offer. If you do, thank you, and please come back. And thanks, Josh. Good, thank you. Cool, let's get dinner. Enjoy. <laughs>